For many of us, it is the most important commitment to take care of our loved ones. We need, we feed as the Beatles song goes, and we work hard to ensure that those close to us are thriving. Today, there are 53 million people taking care of their parents, neighbors, and friends. And there are 53 million stories. From the Stanford Center on Longevity, this is When I'm 64, the podcast for caregivers. I'm your host, Ken Stern. There is a seemingly endless supply of love and devotion for those we care for. But what about something too often in short supply? That's right, money. Every caregiver, it seems, struggles with questions about finances. How do I balance my own work and caregiving? How do I ensure that my loved one has enough to pay for daily living expenses and medical bills? And how do I deal with helping to manage someone else's finances when managing my own is hard enough? Today, we look at how to become more financially secure as caregivers. And we start with the stories of three extraordinary individuals. My name is Judith Kozlowski, and I'm an only child and took care of my parents in different turns over about a little over a decade. So when I think about my own situation, I think like, okay, so maybe working to 70 is not good enough. Maybe I have to work longer than 70. Maybe I have to. And when I think about planning, I'm planning to probably be alive almost entire generation of time. What does that look like for me and how do I want to spend that time? Judith is an attorney who specializes in elder care abuse. So she knows how to recognize fraud and financial irregularities. But even she struggled to manage her parents' accounts and make sure they had enough money for their nearly century-long lives. We start today hearing from caregivers Judith Kozlowski, Terry Corcoran, and Kristen, a caregiver who asked that we use only her first name. I think the financial pressures are enormous, and I think that it is really so easy to lead with your heart first and not your head as a caregiver. And I think that caregivers need to learn to step back from their their heart and their love of the person they're taking care of in a way that is still offers some self-preservation for them for the longer term. My mother was one of those kids who came home from school one day and saw everything in her home on the sidewalk. She saw her father lose his entire business uh, and she never forgot that. And the, the trauma of not saving uh, and not having money was always very you know, big for her. So they were tremendous savers. My father grew up on a farm where he didn't have anything. He said, I didn't know how poor I was until I left the farm, and then I knew how poor I was. Uh, so they saved, and because they were savers and lived modest lives, and they both worked until they were 70, uh, and, were, and, and they would meet with a, a financial person from time to time to look at their retirement plan, when it came time for me to deal with these things, I was incredibly lucky that one, they had planned for years for retirement, and two, they had uh, their rainy day funds. They saved. Uh, they didn't live a fancy lifestyle. They were modest in there, uh, but they did travel the world. I mean, they did a bunch of stuff. They just didn't do it in a fancy way, but they still got to see a lot of things. Um, so when, it, when the time came, I felt like I was um, prepared with enough knowledge. It turns out I didn't know everything. I am Terry Corcoran. I'm 70 years old and I cared for my husband uh, whom I married in 1999 and he came down with fragile X tremor ataxia syndrome which is a genetic neurodegenerative condition that took away all his physical and mental capabilities gradually over the years. There were so many times where I just didn't think I could do this. It's like, you just, you get so tired, you get so overwhelmed. It's like a total nightmare. It's totally surreal. And a lot of caregivers will say that, you know, because here's your spouse and he's just breaking down in so many ways and, and all these things are happening and he can't even communicate with me. And he didn't even know my name after five years of marriage or six years. And, and yeah, it, it was, it was just horrible, but I would have my meltdown and and I just get up and go on. I learned that it was okay to cry. It was okay to even scream if you have to. Um, and I, you know, I ended up. I just just prayed my way through it and prayed I wouldn't have to ever put him in a nursing home. I prayed that he could stay home because I wanted to be with him. You know, this was our whole marriage, and 
the, it was all the illness, but that that's all we had. And so I was determined we were going to be together. And um, so just kind of prayed my way through it and uh, learned to not blame myself when I cried or got upset. My name is Kristen. I'm 33 years old. I live in Hoboken, New Jersey, but I'm originally from Colonia, New Jersey. And my mother, Diane, was diagnosed with early onset Alzheimer's 10 years ago when she was 60. Um, and I, as well as my brother and my father, are the primary caregivers for her. I had received news of the diagnosis. I was living in New York at the time and, and I moved home shortly after. And so I lived with my parents for the first few years of the diagnosis. And it wasn't until I was 26 that I moved out of the house, but by that point she had already been suffering for about three years. I would say the most nervous I became was when she was still in her first facility before we moved her to the nursing home and began the Medicaid process. We, it's a finite well that you're pulling from and we knew the well was going to run out and it's $11,000 that needs to come from somewhere every month per month and I and I'm sure my brother and my father would agree you start to have a little bit of a, a heart attack because we knew that we were going to have to apply for Medicaid but we really needed so many stars to align whether she stayed at the facility that she was at or whether we moved her all of this is essentially a baptism by fire and that's just how we had to learn. Well, I was incredibly lucky. My parents were very straightforward with me about everything. Um, they were really clear about their needs um, uh, for their end of life care. And they were also very open with me, um, I'd say sometime in their 80s, maybe a little earlier, about what their financial picture looked like. I also was, I had, you know, two daughters at the time who were also needed me to be around and my husband and the demands of that particular job at that particular time were just too much. Um, and I'm not the person who gives up too easily on too much, but I realized I just couldn't do that. Um, and I couldn't, I couldn't continue to work at that pace at that time and um, was extremely lucky to find a, um, a place that was a, where, where I was able to become a consultant and set my own hours. And that flexibility uh, changed everything for my ability to be a caregiver for my parents, everything. It, it was scary because I had to quit my own job. I stopped working in the beginning of 2004 because my husband needed full-time care. And about a month or so before, when I saw he couldn't be alone, I hired a home health aide to stay with him while I worked. And he really didn't like that, and I didn't like that, and I didn't really like my job, and I figured all the money I was earning would go to pay her, so if I didn't work, it would be the same difference if I took care of him. So it, it, it was expensive. I mean, I'd go to do my taxes and the tax person would go, oh my God, they couldn't believe what I was spending on, on these aids. I had met with their investment advisor a couple of times and was pretty alarmed at some of the things that had been done. I think he would, they were very much taken advantage of by a particular investment advisor at a very well-known firm uh, and uh, who I think, you know, turned their accounts uh, to make, you know, profits for himself. Um, and so I, I made that change with their permission very early because I saw that I saw that their money wasn't doing any, wasn't working for them. The stories and the vulnerability of older Americans, particularly with regard to their finances, was heartbreaking to me beyond all measure. I also had an uncle who had Alzheimer's and who was taken a advantage of and nearly bankrupted by scams and frauds uh, under the guise of uh, they were all investment frauds um, and I, I when you see it up close and you see people who've worked all their life and who have um, all done the right things you want to somehow be um, a protector of their goodwill their good work somehow 
we had a whole bunch of money stolen from us around 2003 and some it, it was just this person that he actually ripped off a lot of people it was this horrible scam person and my husband lost a whole lot of money with him as did a lot of other people and um we tried to sue him but i told the lawyer i i said i don't even want to get started with this unless you think we can win because i see big medical expenses coming down the road and i don't know what they are and i don't know what's wrong with my husband but by that time he was in a wheelchair when we went to the lawyer's office so i said i don't even want to start this and and it it just it went on for it was the a very stressful thing and we got a judgment against this criminal but there he had not he couldn't pay us anyway we couldn't get what we so I just I needed to walk away from it because I paid you know I just had to walk away from it and and just trust that it would be okay and that we would not need this money that we lost <laughs> my fiance and I talk about finances every week and we know exactly what money is coming into the house and what money is coming out of the house who is who's beneficiary on what account what in the unfortunate event that something were to happen to us, how do we want to use our money or spend our money or where do we want to see it go? So having those conversations is really important. And then the last one is I would just say like, make some sort of a plan. You know, we've made so many decisions, especially in the last five to six years that were just survival. They were not strategic <laughs> necessarily. Um, I do have a lot of regrets, but I have to say that going through it for my mother and now my father is a hearty 78, year, 78 years old, at least we have sort of a foundation to work from for him, which I'm very grateful for. I just wish we didn't have to learn such a hard lesson. The key things are to talk about or to emphasize for me anyway, in, in being able to give this to the, a bigger picture than just me, is that plan for longevity because we are healthier. And, you know, um, when I was, one of my jobs was, um, I started the office for older Americans at the CFPB with a guy named Skip Humphrey. And one of the things that Skip used to always say when we would give these talks, he says, well, we better plan for longevity because we're all going to be drug addicts. The pharmaceutical companies are going to make sure that we are going to be taking everything and, and live long lives. But I don't know that we have to do it that way, but I do think we have to think about and talk about longevity and not forget that that's also part of the planning process. But, you know, planning, planning, planning. And it doesn't matter when you start. I mean, people seem to think sometimes in their 50s and 60s, it's too late, I can't plan anymore. But you can plan. There's, there's money coming in of some sort. You can plan, you know. People forget they're going to live a long time. And whatever you do when you get your retirement money, please don't buy the boat, you know. <laughs> It's so tempting, but don't do it. <laughs> you heard it here first. Don't buy the boat. We just heard from Judith Kozlowski, Terry Corcoran, and Kristen, who preferred that we not share her last name. We now turn to a panel of experts who can help us sort out the very important topic of financially secure caregiving. Cindy Hounsel is president of WISER, which stands for Women's Institute for a Secure Retirement. Roger Whitney is host of the podcast, The Retirement Answer Man, and president of the Rock Retirement Club. And Ron Long is head of Elder Client Initiative Center of Excellence at Wells Fargo & Company. Cindy, we're going to start with you. WISER is a nonprofit organization founded in 1996 to improve opportunities for women to secure retirement income and educate the public about the inequities that disadvantage women in retirement. 66% of the caregivers in the U.S. are women. That's really an extraordinary number. Can you tell us a little bit about how you work to address these inequities? Well, I mean, first of all, we talk to a lot of women that are already caregivers and so who are steeped in it and uh, are, you know, worried about whether or not they can keep up the juggling and the balancing of their home life, their children, their mother or elderly parent. Um, and then, you know, you have the older spouse who is taking care of the other person and, you know, they too are like worried about finances because you know no one thinks this is going to happen to them. That's what I, I find out you know from people all the time. You know I wish I had known. I wish someone had told me. So we try to provide that information. And then what happens 
if you do leave a job that you have and go part time and you know the things to look out for and all of that um, and then resources that people can get to um, that's you know we do that through workshops partnerships uh, we partner with the financial industry in fact they 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 step forward in a big way I, I think the financial industry wanting wanting to know more about this way back so um, we still do a lot of education with them for their advisors and so you know the more people know the more they can make plans and not have shocks happen all the time which is what really happens to a lot of caregivers who leave their job because they can't put up with it anymore I mean it's the women that I I've met that don't have anything that are so brave that like always pushes me you know that the women that don't have money that have these horrific stories who have done everything right taken care of themselves that's that's really what drives I think all of us yeah no it's not it's a it's a terribly challenging situation so uh Ron Long tell us how you uh, you're at a big bank uh, Wells Fargo one of the largest financial services companies in the world which you don't always associate with issues like caregiving how did you and Wells Fargo get involved in caregiving. Tell us, tell us your backstory and the bank's backstory on this. Sure. And thanks, Ken, for inviting me. But this story starts with our financial professionals on the front line, seeing a number of clients who had challenges related mostly to elder financial abuse, but many starting to have those challenges of dementia and diminished capacity. And at that time, there was no playbook for a financial advisor and how you handle those situations. So we started to focus more on it. We hired a gerontologist as a consultant and over time built towards where we are today, where I lead a team called Aging Client Services, which has the prevention of abuse and helping folks manage through life in this area. And then as we quickly saw, the next frontier is that caregiving once you recognize these challenges, caregivers then must step in and play a big role. So what kind of issues um, do your clients and the clients of uh, Wells Fargo bring to you about caregiving? Well, the challenges there start with, for many of us, we don't plan for caregiving. It drops in our laps. And there are a number of challenges when you go from there. There are the financial issues. You may not be all that great a financial manager of your own finances and all of a sudden there you are having to manage mom or dads you may in fact see some financial challenges of your own because you now spend more time unpaid time in many cases helping mom and dad with their caregiving situations and managing their finances which can cause problems for you so roger whitney uh you're you're uh uh, you're a podcaster, actually, This and this month you're doing the Parents Project, uh, talking about issues like caregiving. So what made you, um, in the context of your podcast, start looking at caregiving and other related family issues? So the, the Parent Project came out of the bottom up of having people trying to navigate, one, how do they prepare to potentially have to be a caregiver for their parents who are or on you know, an older vintage of human that are going to be dealing potentially with some of those issues. And then secondly, how do you prepare for yourself so you can have a better journey as you age, as well as prepare your children or so forth? And there's a lot of issues around that. And a lot of it is like, like Ronald mentioned, is the financial part of it, of having to take over the reins. And the other part is, you know, that that is difficult, but it's, structured. The other part is the conversations. How do you begin the dialogue with parents about these things that, that may, they might not be open to? So we thought we'd explore it to help create a guide. So uh, let's actually walk through that guide. Uh, I'll steal your uh, podcast ideas. Uh, why don't you share with our listeners that guide that you're sort of talking about with, with uh, in your podcast? So the first the first step that we we took was to acknowledge the impact it has on you uh, as a an adult that's entering retirement. You know the show's retirement answer man show, so it's focused on people entering retirement and acknowledging, hey, this is going to impact my life. Right, you may not be able to relocate like you planned. 
you may not be able to travel overseas because you need to be close uh, because your parents need help. You may, your retirement may become impaired. So it started off with acknowledging, hey, this may impact your life if it's not dealt with or it, it and so acknowledging that, and then we start walking towards, okay, well, how do you start to identify some of this stuff? And, and Ron, we heard earlier uh, in this podcast from Judith, a caregiver who had those, whose parents actually did have those conversations with her, uh, who sat down and thought about the impact on, uh, on her of the cost of caregiving. Is that a normal thing or is that a usual thing um, that you see? And how hard it is for people to have those difficult conversations about money and planning with their parents. No, it's not as normal as it should be. And we really want those conversations to take place more often. There are challenges. One, many parents come from a vintage that you don't talk finances with your kids. Two, the talking of finances inevitably go to what we all know is a road that ends pretty much with us not being here anymore. And for a lot of us, that's not a comfortable conversation as the parent to lead. And we have seen also on the other end, many children don't want to face that mortality of mom and dad. So they may be putting up a stiff arm and refusing to have those conversations. Cindy Hansel, we talked to the caregiver, Judith Kozlowski, earlier. She observed that caregivers often think financially with their hearts and not their heads. How do you counsel people to be thoughtful about their financial situations and plan ahead for what might be years of caregiving? Right. Well, I mean, I, I think that, that that whole emotional heart piece is there for caring for somebody, but the financial has caught up because of the economy and people understanding more and more that if, if I make a mistake, I may not be able to catch up from that. And I'm either, you know, 50, getting closer to retirement age where I, I really need to have my, my ducks in a row. Um, and so I, I think I think it's changed when I when I go to conferences and I talk to uh, people that have been in the caregiving world for a long time, 30, 40 years, we'll say the first question people ask now is how, how are we going to get this paid for? What how, what can we do? What do we have to do? So I think that world is changing. Roger Whitney, one of the things that we've observed when we talk to the caregivers for this episode is not just the cost of caregiving for their parents or loved ones but the time it takes away from their own earned potential, from their work. Some have to cut back on hours. Some have to leave work. How how does someone plan for that? Well, there's a couple things. And, you know, the the time to prepare for storms is always when there isn't one, right? Um, And whether it's the the time away and, and foregone income because you've had to slow down or whether you have to leave your job or whether it's just simply the cost of outsourcing the caregiving, while you are at work, it's very much like lots of things that we could get hit with. And and, and so early on, building the financial, getting the financial house in order and having ample cash reserve and doing all those little things right over the years is what's gonna ultimately make you more resilient to the impact. Uh, The hard part is we tend not to, Think about them before they become something that's evident, right? And, um, and, and, and the real question becomes, what do you do if you didn't do all that other stuff? And now you're in a situation where you have to leave hours and, and forego income in order to potentially be a caregiver or pay for someone. And you have to define what are my options and what are my choice set and then work through what is most reasonable to do, because it's just a, just like if you hadn't saved enough for retirement, there are options. It's just a matter of whether you're willing to acknowledge them and then work through which one seems to to, to provide the best solution. It's not easy. And, and Ron, we heard earlier, one of the things that Judith, uh, the caregiver, talked about was um, seeing as she began to look into her, uh, fa- her parents' finances, uh, some indications of financial fraud, uh, uh, advisor in that case, churning their accounts. Um, she, and she had an uncle who was defrauded in a big scheme out in California. Uh, now she's a, uh, she was a fraud prosecutor. So she had some certain, uh, certain abilities that the rest of us don't have. What's the, 
what are you from your vantage point? What should caregivers look out for if they're worried about financial fraud for their for their loved ones? No, it's just that the, to understand what you're looking at and making sure that it, if it doesn't look good to you, get in and address it early. Sometimes directly with if it's a professional who's off target, have that conversation early. Document what's been said to you and what based. Uh, what you say to them, but also be willing to look through the whole financial picture. To Roger's point, sometimes it's not just the brokerage account. You need to see that full picture. You, you have some folks, and charities are nice people sometimes, and many times they go overboard and you start seeing more and more money given to a charity literally at the expense of that adult's own financial health. And so we need to be in a position to look through the full picture and then be ready to step in and have those direct conversations. And if need be, go to get assistance from a legal professional. Roger, have you seen that in your professional practice? Uh, um, the challenge that uh, older clients or parents of clients face with um, elder abuse and uh, fi elder financial abuse? I haven't had elder abuse from outsiders, but uh, where in these type of things, we think of the big ones, right? Um, there's a lot that happens around the edges between going to get your oil changed and ending up spending $500 on things you don't need. Um, there, you know, there's a lot of, there's probably more of that seepage that happens of just, taking advantage in little ways, knowing that someone isn't quite as clear as, you know, as maybe a younger person might be, but that happens at every age. Uh, where I have seen it and have dealt with it directly is really the kids. When we, you know, uh, you know the situation I'm thinking of is a married couple, one ran everything and the other one was the primary caregiver. When the manager of the finances passed away, they specifically had everything put into a trust uh, managed by a bank trustee. And then I'm, I'm, I, I work with the client because the kids would have done it. And the parent would have allowed it because they love their kids. And that's their one relationship. So I've seen it in that way. And I think thinking about those things of, of one, how do you have some visibility? and uh, in an internal way, one thing that I had a family member do was go have these this dialogue with the parents and set up and organize so they could have access to observe the accounts, just so they could watch to look for those trends that Ron mentioned. Because a lot of times it's the seepage stuff, not necessarily the huge stuff that's just going to come out and say, you know, be very evident. Cindy Hounsel, let's leave on a happy note. What's gotten better in terms of financial planning since you've been running Wiser for women and caregivers? I think more women are interested and more women, even if they don't take the steps they know they should and they'll, you know, say that they're, you know, they're about to do something and they'll write to us and tell us how it worked and how happy they are that um, we, we had a great letter just before Christmas from a woman who said, I was going through a bad divorce. I read everything you had. I decided not to try to keep up the same lifestyle. I downsized, I saved, I paid off my debt. And in all of this, I, I am so grateful because I don't have to worry about anything. Cindy Hounsel, President of Wiser, Roger Whitney, host of the podcast, The Retirement Answer Man, and Ron Long, Head of Elder Client Initiative Center of Excellence at Wells Fargo. Our senior producer for When I'm 64 is Carrie Thompson. Our associate producer is Avad Ahmad Begi, and our intern is Ellie Wartell. Special thanks to Wells Spouse Association and Alzheimer's New Jersey. Please like us on iTunes and leave us a review. You can find out more about us by visiting our website, longevity.stanford.edu. You've been listening to When I'm 64, the podcast for caregivers. Thanks for joining us. I'm Ken Stern.